Okay. okay. Hi, First everyone. Uh, thank you for joining tonight's virtual studio visit with artist Jennifer Sassir, class of 73. Um, this is a virtual tour of her Tribeca home and studio, and she'll be discussing 45 years of her studio practice and public art career. Um, and she has worked with New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, the Guggenheim Museum, Pratt Institute, um, Socrates Sculpture Park, MoMA um, P. S1, Cooper Hewitt, um, and many more. Uh, I will turn it over to Jennifer and she will uh, start the tour. Okay, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm totally new at this. And so I'm starting off on my cell phone so I can show you around where I live and work. Uh, so uh, please be patient. <laughs> I'm really glad everybody could make it. Uh, I, I'll show you, I've lived in this space uh, since I moved here in 1975. And it pretty much is like archeology. span It has everything I've ever done. And um, I thought it would be best to do this first. And then we'll go to sort of a PowerPoint. I'll show you the work that I've been doing lately. And then we'll go to a PowerPoint of uh, more of my public artwork and sort of how that all began and maybe end up back here in the studio, okay? All right, here we go. Uh, please bear with me. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, uh, I was really happy to go to Cornell and I've made so many long-term friends and associates from them. And many of you may be in the audience right now. So welcome. Uh, all right, I'll just give you sort of an overview. I'll try to do this like slowly. Uh, this is a old warehouse and you may have seen these. Uh, this one is pretty much the way it was in 1975 when I moved in. And uh, it's where I live and work. And uh, uh, just to sort of give you an overview, it's not, a fancy place or that trick stuff or anything. Um, this is um, uh, one of my paintings of the navigational chart series, uh, which I started pretty much a little bit before the pandemic. I did a lot of painting uh, during the pandemic using um, navigational charts. I My first job in New York was working in a shop selling navigational charts because there used to be boats down here. I live about a block and a half from the Hudson River. These paintings were sort of all about swimming. Uh, I have a little house on Long Island and I was dreaming of having a swimming pool and they're made with charts of various places that I love and know and old beach towels collaged with gel thick and paint, which I've been using for probably a good 40 years at least. So I'll show you a few more paintings in the space. This one is also based on swimming and it's called night swimming. I did eventually build a swimming pool. Even during the pandemic, I got it done. So I was happy about that. Um, I hope I'm not going too fast. Let me know, Kirsten, if my technical whatever. Uh, this is another one called Pond. So they're all based on water, uh, living by the water and um, the more abstract expressionist than my, uh, what I'm sort of known for a bit, which is the pattern and decoration movement, which some of you may be familiar of, which has more of a recognizable pattern. I'll show you a piece that I did uh, early on in this series. This is actually a piece from about 45 years ago that was part of an installation. Um, I started doing installations of domestic objects that became, a, they got arranged into rooms. So this, this is one of the remaining pieces that I have that I still display. But you can see that it's a very noticeable pattern 
and uh, the repetition of motif and all of that, especially you people that took J.O. Mahoney's course. Uh, <laughs> one of the earlier pieces in this series of navigational charts, uh, you can see that the pattern is more evident and it's a little bit more controlled and sort of less uh, abstract expressionist. And so now I've gone completely sort of uh, expressive and the other way and using paint a lot more um, liberally, but it's still gel thickened. I basically use the same materials. They all have fabric, some sort of collage and gel thickened acrylic paint, which I'll show you as I walk over here, you'll see the space. It's about 2000 square feet. Um, movie stars and famous people live across the street and around the corner. <laughs> uh, you'll see that I have work tables full of lots of paint and I make sort of these modified pastry tubes that I've been using forever that I use to apply the paint. Well, here's pretty much my workspace. I, um, you can get maybe if I hope I'm not going too fast. When I left Cornell, I was a traditional sort of diesel painter. And when I came to New York, I met some friends who had some tickets to an opening at the Whitney because they worked for the printer. So we went there and they suggested that maybe I could sell some of my little paintings as textile designs. So uh, we did and I did. And that's sort of how I became interested in pattern. And that lasted for about six months. And I, my designs were kind of popular for a while. And then when they sort of fell out of fashion, I went back to painting, but I kept seeing patterns everywhere. So they sort of combine a bit with these navigational chart pieces. This is a piece that I just, I'm thinking about doing. I just kind of started it today, laying out the chart. I kind of now have found charts that I like based on color and the design. And I use these elements, I'll walk over here, um, of bits of fabric. I have all kinds of fabric everywhere, as you can see that I've collected. I grew up in Indiana and I was a 4-H girl and I love doilies and laces and all of that sort of thing. I don't know why, but I did and I collected them. So I have all this material here that uh, I'm planning on using in this new piece. I also have some navigational charts I have like a collection of those and I keep ordering those up. And I just got this map of guess where? Or now. So who knows, that might be the next one. I think Jeff Schwartz suggested that, but I sort of like this red color. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, here, let me show you a couple more paintings down here. Storage, storage, storage. And these, you know, are fairly recent where the, the charts have been kind of obliterated a bit. They sort of are not so important. They're more of a jumping off point, but they become more <clears throat> a formal element, you know, the color and uh, something to kind of riff off of. But um, a lot of the fabric in this piece, for example, is an old Chanel uh, bedspread that was my grandmother's. So there's all this sort of history of lace making and needlework, women's work, um, craft, uh, that has been my concern for pretty much my whole career. You know, it's been kind of largely overlooked as a fine art material until kind of recently, I think. I think a lot of younger people are <clears throat> using craft and it's not sort of, uh, thought of this the same way, sort of a second rate or not a serious material. You know, craft was a way, a uh, legitimate way for women to kind of express their creativity. It was sort of non-threatening. 
it wasn't really considered intellectual. And uh, I, through my work, both public and in the studio, I've always tried to draw attention and elevate that and highlight it as something important and that needs to be looked at. So uh, here's another piece of this series. Uh, at the same time, I've been revisiting little sculptures that I have done that I would like to see made into large public pieces. So, and I'll just show you around briefly. Here's my, my desk, my bedroom, and my dog. <laughs> so I think you have a pretty good idea of what this is like. And uh, I think, Kirsten, I could probably go back to the computer now if you think that would be good and we could do the PowerPoint or see if there are any questions. I don't know, what do you think? Um, yeah, sure, you can uh, You can certainly go to your um, computer, switch over if you, if you would like. Um, yeah, it might, be, it might be a good time for questions, um, you know, from the audience about like the, the tour portion and then, you know, we can take more questions at the end. At the end. Does anybody, anybody have a question? Um, you can either just you know turn on uh, turn on your microphone and um, you know oh I don't know how to question do that. or you're welcome to um, add it to the chat and I can read it aloud if anyone has any questions. Um, in the meantime, okay, Jennifer's okay. So I'm going to connect here. now to my computer, right? Yes. Yeah, so I have you. Um, um, getting out of the waiting room. So if you want to exit, um, leave the meeting from your phone. We won't okay. have to feedback. Okay. Okay, now. Okay. Excuse me, I have a question. Uh, let's Thank give Jennifer just one second so she can join from the uh, from her computer. Hold on. Just taking a minute. Okay, so Jennifer, Jennifer should be on now. Let me see. So Jennifer, I think you need to join. Um, you just need to turn on your camera and microphone again. I'll give her a second to do that. If anyone else would like to um, add questions into the chat, I can, uh, you know, we can get them ready for for Jennifer to answer. Um, oh, Jennifer, hi. Uh, you just need to turn on your microphone. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I believe we have uh, one question already um, from. Is it Mr. Steiner? <laughs> Charlie. Or, or, yeah. Or I'm, I apologize. Who, who was asking the question beforehand? It was me, Charles Steiner. <laughs> One of uh, my favorite periods of Jennifer's work is um, when she did things that looked like um, icing on a cake with a, the icing bag. Yeah. And I, don't think that should be eclipsed as um, because I think it contributed to her eventual um, marriage to pattern and decoration, um, and I, I think it was very was a very formative period. And I wondered if she had any other examples easily accessible to the camera to show people who might not be familiar with that okay. period in her um, artistic oeuvre. Uh, well, I'm going to, I'm actually going to show some of those um, installation shots of the domestic uh, objects that, uh, including PS1, that are uh, with the uh, uh, icing-like bag of paint. Uh, I, you might not have been able to see in the loft here or on these pieces close up, or even the piece that I showed, but the, the paint is very thick. And uh, I still use the gel thickened medium and 
and extrude it like you would icing for a cake. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Uh, we do I have, don't know if that answered, but whatever. We do have a few questions uh, from the chat. Uh, so first okay. question, um, what street do you live on uh, in Tribeca and what was the neighborhood like when you moved in? Okay, I live on Franklin Street between West Broadway and Hudson and everybody left at four o'clock. It was all loading docks and a lot of abandoned buildings. I've lived, I was a, uh, it was illegal. This was a um, uh, warehouse. So it wasn't residential. Uh, it was a commercial space. It didn't really become residential, I think until about uh, 1980 or 1979, something around that. And uh, it was being a pioneer and uh, an urban pioneer. It was really exciting uh, because there were artists here mostly uh, after four o'clock. So you got to meet everybody that was around and you didn't use the telephone. You could yell from across the street or through the air well, you saw somebody and meet. Um, you had to take your keys and put them in a sock to throw them down to the street when somebody came to visit so they could get in because there's no buzzers or anything and uh, no cell phones. Uh, it was really great actually. It was hard to sort of get food and basic stuff. So it's like, as I've aged, it's actually the neighborhood has sort of come along. So now I can, or there's a whole food, you know, and a pharmacy and stuff like that. But back then there wasn't anything. But it was really fun. It was a great place. It was a great place and it was a great time. So um, there was art on the beach, you know, down while the World Trade Center was being built. So artists went down there and did projects. It was all sand. It was all landfilled and covered with sand. So, um, you know, it's just very romantic. Uh, I felt lucky that, uh, I still feel lucky. I think, you know, this is a great place um, to live. Thank you. Um, and for the nautical chart series of paintings, um, are you actually painting on top of the charts and attaching a fabric scraps, uh, et cetera? Yeah, um, the, the charts are become like I showed on that one canvas that I'm working on. I adhere the chart to the canvas, then I collage it uh, and paint onto it. Um, so it really, you know, is part of it. Uh, when I got this loft, my uh, landlord at the time, he uh, owned a chart shop and everybody had to pay a fixture fee in order, to, there were no fixtures. They put the plumbing risers and the electrical, whatever. And then you had to pay for so-called fixtures. And I didn't really have the money, but I told him I did. So he realized I didn't. So I had to go work for him until I paid off my debt. So I was an indentured servant at the chart shop which wasn't so bad because nobody ever came in. So I could just spend my day looking at charts, kind of imagining these places and putting them in drawers and, and cutting off corners because they were all expired, which I didn't know that's what you had to do. So I was actually getting ready for this show, which I'll show you. I, I don't know if you, can you see this? Yeah. So this was a show uh, that I was in in 2018, 2019 that traveled in Europe and opened in Geneva, Switzerland at MAMCO, Museum of Art and Museum of Art and Contemporary Art, I guess, and Le Consortium in Dijon, France. And this, uh, these two curators decided that there was a movement called Pattern and Decoration, which some people had written about. And I always saw myself as kind of loosely at the edge of this, maybe. Um, there was a dealer, Holly Solomon, who had a lot of the artists that were uh, represented in that movement. So I was really very grateful to be included in this show, which was really exciting. And it was more of an eclectic view. So I don't know, I don't wanna to get too art historical on everybody, uh, but um, people like Linda Bangless and some other European artists like Claude Villant and others were in included in this, so it made sort of a broader scope of it. Um, and the pieces that I have in this show were these domestic objects that Charlie was kind of talking about. I don't know if you can see this, 
but that are highly decorated. They're collaged with fabric lace, found laces and doilies that I collected and then collaged with um, paint. So this is something I call cat throne and um, chandelier. So I still have been making these, like I did a chandelier for a train station in Cleveland. And I, so uh, these objects are still are very important to me. And I like to put them in the public realm. I like to put something very domestic, uh, kind of upending expectations of what you're gonna find, you know, in a train station or uh, a building or whatever. And most public sculpture until fairly recently has been pretty um, macho, you know, big metal sculptures and that kind of thing. So uh, these are the pieces that are rep represented me in this show that traveled for like a year. So this is a really cool catalog. Uh, you can get it from Le Consortium or Amazon or I forget where else. La Presse is de Real is the publisher. Anyway, so uh, yeah, this is what Charles was talking about. This is just one of the end papers, but you can kind of see from this, this they put on that some, that paint is one of my pieces. So you can see how thick it is. Okay. Um, anyway, okay. Any other questions or we go to the PowerPoint? Um, let's go to the PowerPoint. Uh, okay. you, the last question. I, I have I have one comment. Hi, Hi. Jill. Hi, Jen. So <laughs> just for everybody, in case they don't know, like those aren't pictures, right? Of no, those, right. They're, three, they're the actual they're they're objects. They're pictures they're of objects. That yeah, were these pictures. are pictures. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Jill. These are sculptures. And so like, right. for example, like here's like a little maquette I've been working on. Right. Um, so this is how it kind of starts. The actual piece that I did in Cleveland, the chandelier is about 15 feet long and uh, uh, seven and a half feet high. So, and it's these five adjoining spheres of uh, steel that is a uh, laser cut to look like is based loosely inspired by a crochet pattern. So the whole thing of needlework has been a really important organizing factor for these projects, um, you know, inside and outside and in the built environment and in interior spaces also, installations of rooms. Any other questions? All right. Um, well, uh, I can I can go into the PowerPoint. Okay. If okay. Have any other questions? Yeah, that's fine. All right. Great. So, we'll get to it. Okay. Uh, um, Okay. Okay, that's me at Cornell. <laughs> you can see that I haven't really changed that much. Anyway, uh, uh, so uh, we can go to the next slide. The next. Okay, this is when I came to New York. I mentioned that I began doing textile design uh, uh, for my meeting my Cornell friends at the Whitney, and this is an example of one of my textile designs. Um, this is on wax masa paper, so I worked both on the front and the back. And this is kind of how I became really interested and obsessed with patterns. So I used a, uh, th this was sprayed through pieces of lace to create this. You know, I first laid out this diagonal pattern, and then I used these overlays of lace. Actually, I've been doing this forever and sprayed through them uh, with paint. Uh, this is one of the first and probably one of the most important art pieces I ever did. Um, this is at PS1 in Queens, and this is right in 1979 when it was still 
uh, a lot of highs had taken it over and it was an abandoned school and they rented it from New York City for one dollar and artists were given um, I was lucky to be given an old classroom to kind of do whatever I wanted so this installation is called In My Room and I use various textiles, an old sofa that I found uh, at Bloomingdale's actually, it was uh, whatever. And it's all been collage uh, with this whole method and materials that I've worked with all this time with the laces and doilies and the gel thickened paint and um, this piece you see on the floor are uh, tiles from a ceiling, ceiling tiles, tin ceiling tiles that I, uh, you know, with a lot of extruded paint, which is sort of a riff on a Carl Andre piece, you may know, who is a famous minimalist sculptor. So this is kind of like a little bit of a slap in the face to him or ha 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 raspberry. Uh, anyway, and there's my dog. Uh, you see that black thing on the floor? That's actually my dog from Cornell. <laughs> I've always had black dogs. Okay, we can go to the next one. This is a sort of another view. I apologize for the quality of these, but these are scans from 1979. And recently they've been published uh, by MoMA because MoMA is PS1. And so now they're in the archive of MoMA PS1 and I was very happy we can go to the next one. Um, here's a shot of that same room. This is a, that MoMA took um, their black and white photos. Uh, so you can see sort of the condition of the space, right? Um, you know, the floors and, you know, whatever. Uh, so this actually where you see this sort of giant pattern of leaf-like things it's really hard, I know, to see the detail, but that was the old uh, blackboard, chalkboard of the classroom. And I made curtains for all the windows and tried to make it as a, you know, a comment on domesticity and feminism as much as I possibly could. And it was in January, late December, January, it was absolutely freezing because there really was no heat and, you know, everybody got really sick. Okay, so we can go to the next one. Okay, so this is an interesting, this piece is 20 feet in diameter. We're now jumping to 2009. And you know, I've been using these doilies and laces and needlework in all my work, collaging it, using it on objects, making sculptures, doing installation. And Socrates Sculpture Park, which some of you may know, which is in Long Island City, invited me out and said, let's go for a walk around the park. And I was really shocked because I had never worked outside. And this is like an example of a really great curator because they sometimes have visions and see things that, well, I would have never thought of working outdoors, frankly, I had never thought about it. And they had this idea. So this was not the first idea uh, I wanted to, there's an entrance to the park that has a big billboard and I wanted to drape a big doily over that billboard like you might on the back of a sofa. But uh, Stephen Shore had been given that space. So they, we came up with this idea. So this is a 20 foot diameter ripstop nylon doily that I figured out with some architectural model makers that we laser cut in 36 pieces, like pie pieces. And then I sewed it together by hand because I really didn't know how, how else to do it. And then we, we had to figure out how to get it up there. And I had a friend who had a son who was mad about fishing and having dinner with him one night, I said, well, I don't know what to do about this. And he said, oh, we'll use a fishing line and crimps and that's how you're gonna rig it. So I hired him, he was a high school student and he rigged the whole thing for me. And I would pick him up at school and have a sandwich for him. And then we'd drive out to Long Island City. He is now an architect. I said to his mother, he's gonna be an architect and he, he is. So he didn't go to Cornell, he went to Cooper, but he's, he's an architect. So this was the first of my outdoor projects. 
Okay, so we can go to the next one. This is another one. I did three pieces that we hung in the trees and you can sort of see the grommets and the a little bit of the um, fishing line. Uh, this I use color, gel thickened paint, extruded the same way that I always do. Um, it, I think the close up of it is a really nice, I call this rose window, you know, referencing architecture, obviously. And um, there's something about the way, you know, the, the leaves make a kind of leafy pat, lacy kind of pattern themselves, you know, when you look up at a bunch of um, leaves in a tree. Well, one thing about these sculptures that I had anticipated that I love is that they, they moved because, you know, there'd be wind and air. And so they really seemed alive. It was really great. It was a great experience. Okay, this is another one. So I did three, this one I called Leaf. And it's about five feet in diameter. And it's another ripstop nylon um, uh, laser cut. The other thing was we didn't know we did a test. We didn't know, you know, sometimes when you cut with a laser, it leaves a burned edge, but ripstop nylon it is very nice. So it didn't leave a burned edge. It didn't leave a brown kind of line or anything. So uh, these were great. The thing is that they couldn't last forever because fabric and all of this degrades over time, you know, in the elements. And uh, so they're not permanent. So I had to move on to other materials. This is um, a piece I did for um, the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. They were doing a bunch of renovations and all you architects out there, I always thought that, you know, that orange mesh they put on buildings and construction sites is really unnecessary. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that unattractive. So I, I, this is printed. This is actually printed on, uh, this is construction mesh. Yeah, this is printed construction mesh. So uh, I had this idea with the DOT, um, Department of Transportation, New York City Urban Art Program. And so uh, we, we, this is a piece that we did and it was at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. They were doing renovations and we're just rigging it now. But I just thought you could see sort of a close up. Uh, still the same lace doily idea, okay. All right, next. Okay, so then I wanted to make something a little more permanent. And uh, this is water jet aluminum. So this is a bench. And you probably on my website, if you've seen, you've seen different iterations of this. It's, I call it double doily because it's basically two doilies um, folded together. Only this is uh, aluminum, 5 eighths aluminum powder coated and you can sit on it, you can ride a skateboard over it. Um, so this is outside PS1. There's like a little plaza at PS1 in Queens. And you can see all the construction. Uh, this bench has gone to California and all kinds of places. But it's one of the first permanent materials. Okay, yeah, next. Okay, then it, this is just a close up of two of the globes arriving in Cleveland. Uh, this is was a new, uh, I, I should probably should have included more uh, images of the site. It was the first a new uh, sort of like rapid train station they had built in Cleveland in about 50 years. And it's at the junction of two neighborhoods, Little Italy and University Circle. And so there's a very, there's still an Italian American community. Uh, and uh, then there's the Cleveland Art Museum and all the university hospitals. So it's kind of this really important site. So I proposed to do a chandelier in the space that were, that was uh, five of these intersecting globes of this uh, pattern that's based on um, a, uh, crochet pattern called grape leaf or grapevine, something like that. And next, this is steel. So here we are starting to install it. 
This piece is so large and I have to say we didn't really get great photos. It, there's kind of this, um, uh, the space is this outside atrium space that you walk into, then you walk into the station and up to the platforms. It's sort of indoor outdoor space. So there's like a, a concrete kind of overhang or whatever. So you underneath see this little bits of lace like a skirt or yeah, a woman's hem sort of hanging down. It's a good, good uh, counterpoint, I think, to the, the, the materials that are in the space and kind of unheard of really. A little bit radical, I think. A little subversive, all this petticoat stuff. Okay, next. Okay, here's, you, you can see looking up that um, it's like these spheres of, of uh, lace in the kind of unfinished, not really, you know, whatever. And uh, that's my only permanent piece that I've ever done so far. Um, which took me about two years to do. And uh, I, I wanna do some more because it's really fun. I actually really enjoy working with all the different trades and um, collaborating uh, and the sort of challenge of doing it. I, I didn't know that I would like it, but I, I really did. And, oh yeah, there it is. This is, we're getting ready for the opening. <laughs> <laughs> and you can sort of see that this little bit of it as you come into the space, so it's indoor, outdoor kind of thing. That's me and that's my, my dad and that's the, I think the mayor or the head of the RT, uh, RTA, I don't know. Anyway, the Regional Transportation Authority. Uh, I think that's really it, let me see. Oh yes, this is a picture of me. This is that uh, from this book here, from this catalog. And so I'm just looking forward. I, I really would like to do some more public art projects. That's what I'd like to be doing now. But the pandemic, I think, is waning. OK. OK. So um, yeah, we have a couple more questions, unless you would like to uh, go over anything else first. I don't think so, no. OK, perfect. Um, so we have. Uh, how did you actually hang your lacy sculptures? Uh, did someone climb up in the tree? Um, oh, so I think you kind of went over that already with um, uh, yeah, you know, pushing. Yeah, we on. used a fork lift. We used a lift uh, to get in the trees. They're like 20 feet up. So we were in a lift. So I do have a lot of really cool photographs of that and looking down, looking over the East River. So it would be Sam, the kid, me, and uh, one of the helpers uh, from Socrates. But it was hard because um, it's, hard to, it's hard to install, you know, uh, but it was fun. It took, it took a while, but we figured it out. It was exciting. Yeah, um, and then uh, did you see any par parallels between the patterns in your lace doily collection, uh, sorry, creations, and some uh, some of William Morris's textile and wallpaper designs? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, uh, when I first came to New York and also when I was doing a lot of this textile design, I just read this in the paper actually that they've opened up the, um, in the New York City Public Library where you can get actual physical references images you can take them out I don't know if you know about that it's a great resource lots of artists have used it over the years but you can go there and you can get and they'll give you like mounted on a piece of cardboard a little piece of William Morris's or a reproduction of a piece of wallpaper or you know an Indian a Native American blanket or whatever so you can get all these different source materials and we used to go up there to the 42nd Street Library all the time and go to the picture collection and get those references. And, of course, uh, I love the books. Did you teaching have any impact on your work? Yeah, oh yeah, a lot of you might not know this, but I worked at the Guggenheim for about 17 years and I was a teaching artist for more than that. And I worked in the New York City Public Schools and I worked a lot in Chinatown at PS42, which I absolutely loved. 
and I would try out my projects, of course, a lot of my ideas of my students. And one of my most successful, I think, was we decided to make symbols. So we made prints of sort of symbols that made sense to the students. And we printed them on muslin fabric. And uh, then after we had all this fabric, I said, oh, gosh, what are we going to do with this? So then uh, we decided to make clothing out of it. So we all made these outfits and hats and clothing. And then we put on, which there is a video of, I think it's on the Guggenheim site. We did a fashion show for the whole school. Uh, so the kids wore the, the clothes that they made and they talked about, you know, on the runway, the symbols and what inspired them to, what it said about them and what inspired them to make the clothing. So yeah, I used a lot of textile sewing and whatever in my lessons. <laughs> Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So those are the questions that we have in the chat right now. Um, okay. Does anyone like to, um, you know, get on, uh, turn on their microphone and ask any questions? Welcome to do so. It looks like Judith Bloom has her hand raised. No. Oh, okay, I think that was perhaps an accident. I will unraise nope. that. It's really nice to see everybody. A lot of you I haven't seen in a while. Yay. Nice to see you. Yeah. So I wanna thank Cornell and the Cornell Club. I thought this was really fun. And um, I'd be uh, happy to um, have people come to my real studio when you feel like you can, or it's, it's a good time. Any other questions, comments? Yay, Jennifer. Hi, <laughs> hi. Hi, Mary Shepard. Hi, Charles Steiner. Hi. Up in the woods there in Wisconsin. I enjoyed it. Very nice. Very nice summary of your work, I think. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I was a little, I didn't know what to do exactly, but I just decided to have a good time. I thought it was, the teaching part was really interesting also the influence of teaching and your influence on your students. I thought that was um, very important, actually, to your contribution to the world. Oh, thank Hi. you. Thank you. you. We would do an exhibition every year. Uh, there'd be an exhibition at the Guggenheim called Year with Children. And uh, I just look forward to that. And we did some really fun installations and yeah, it's very important to me. Very important. Well, it's just I've part. known you a long time, and I had never heard those stories. So, oh really? Oh really? I, I really. <laughs> there are a lot them. of them. There are a lot of them. Uh oh, I'm afraid now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to look forward to your talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, I show something? Sure. Yeah. Without the chat, I taught art for many years in high school. I graduated from Cornell. School of AAP, 1963, and I taught many years in my art in my neighborhood. That's great. I think that your work is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I had a, a, it was very rich experience having this kind of collaboration with these students and being part of this school, having worked at that school for 17 years. And a lot of my students were, um, new immigrants. I mean, we would get students every week or two. And I had one class I really liked with a teacher named Mrs. Ho, and she taught the students that just arrived. So we had a lot of different dialects and everything. So I didn't speak any Mandarin or Cantonese or anything, but those were some of the most amazing and wonderful enriching moments. And we did incredible work, incredible work. What age did you teach? What uh, were the mostly kids? I would say fourth and fifth grade. I really liked fourth and fifth grade. Mm. I mean, because by fourth and fifth grade, they're people, right? And they have ideas and personality and they know what they want to do and whatever. And that I have to say the principal of the school was amazing because they had to change their schedule for me because I didn't just teach for one period. I would be given two, three periods at a time. So the schedule had to be really, you know how this can be in a public school, really uh, 
accommodated this whole program. And the teachers put in so much work, you know, because this was not general curriculum at all. Every year I would make something up new because it would be more fun. So, you know, it was a lot of work for everybody and everybody was really into it. So it was great, it was just great. And then when that school didn't wanna do it anymore, or whatever, I was finished, you know, that was enough because I just didn't feel like starting over somewhere with a new school. Oh, fantastic. Any, any any other questions? I just have one comment. Thank you, Jennifer. It's really great to see the whole retrospective of from the from Cornell all the way till now. And I personally also just love the fact that your work has become public art. I just think that's it's so beautiful out there, outdoors, in the trees, like you said, and it just takes it to a different scale. And I don't know, I just think it's 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 great public art, I think. Well, thank, thank you, Jill. I, I, I really want to do a lot more public art and I, I really thought about this. There's like a lot of things going on lately this last couple of weeks that has kind of forced me to look back and look at things in a good way and have to kind of, and I can sort of see that these objects and putting this stuff out in the world, uh, I've, I have a long history of it actually. And I think it's been uh, a very, an influence maybe on, on younger people, uh, I hope so, younger artists. And I would, I just hope uh, I get the opportunity to do some more of this. Hello, Jennifer. Hi, hi, Deborah. <laughs> I'll see you well, tomorrow. I know Jennifer from high school <laughs> and yeah. Cornell. Yeah. Um, it was a great presentation. It's wonderful. Oh, thanks. Thank uh, actually, you. Deborah and I did this thing. We went to a boarding school um, uh, called Abbott Academy that's now part of Andover. And we did this thing. I don't know how we did this, but we got them to what? Call off school for two days. We right. said they should have this thing called creative days, that everything was like too scheduled, overscheduled, and people wouldn't know what to do with themselves. So that everything would be open and people could go around and try all different things. And they did it, right? Right. And it wasn't just for students. It was we made sure that the faculty and the administration also participated in this these creative days with the students. Yeah, I, I don't know where how we came up with that, but whatever. We were <laughs> stubborn, we were idealistic and stubborn. <laughs> yeah. Let's get to see. Yeah, we have one more comment um, from one of our um, attendees. Um, have you ever visited the Dale uh, Tehuli Museum in Seattle? I think you would find it inspirational for your outdoor uh, public works. Uh, no, I haven't had the opportunity of doing that. I did see some, I have seen some of his pieces in other outdoor settings that, that the, the sort of glass rods <laughs> that look like, um, reeds or something, you know, growing out. And I really like that idea of um, something that evokes nature, but is man-made. It's kind of cool. Uh, I, I don't know. No, I have never even been to Seattle. All right. And anyway, well, thanks everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, our next thank you, tour... Kirsten, for everything, really. Yeah, thank you. Our next virtual uh, studio tour will be with uh, Charles Steiner, also class of 73, and that'll be on October 14th. Uh, it's not yet available on our website to register, but um, we'll have it up shortly. And um, yeah, thank you again, Jennifer. Yeah, and thanks. everyone, have a wonderful evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Jim. Bye. Uh, that was awesome.